You can't help but love this time of year. It's Christmas time and there's something in the air. There's a little bit of heaven everywhere. Somehow there's a little more of love Maybe there's a little less of us Or maybe we're just slightly more aware There's a little bit of heaven everywhere It's the smile Good morning. Good to have everybody here today. And as we start this service, we're going to be concentrating on God's love. Probably the best known verse in the Bible is John 3.16. It says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. God didn't send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. All right, so let's all stand and sing to the Lord today. And just uh, lift your voices to the Lord in this place. From the darkness I called your name Into darkness your mercy came You called me out, lifted me up How great is your love You bore my weakness, you took my of grace you call me out lifted me up how great is your love from the heights of heaven you stepped down to earth innocent perfection gave your life for us to be our How great. 
never been and there will never be a God like you a love so true there has never been and there will never be a God like you a love so true there has never been God gave us. We have a Savior. What a tremendous gift. A child has been given. The King of our freedom. Sing for the light has come. This is Christmas. Come and the door. This is Christmas. This is Jesus. Savior. 
Praise the Lord in the place. Lift his name high. Amen. Praise his name. Kids Zone will be dismissed, and as those guys scooch past you, you can be seated. We are no longer lost because he has come down for us. Isn't that wonderful news? It's good news because it's a fact. It's true. We're no longer lost because he's come down for us. What a humble servant that is. This morning, our men are going to come. We're going to prepare to take our offering because now more than... I confess more than any other time, I understand how great I need a Savior who came down for me. And during this time, when we look at trash piles and we look at concrete for carpet, <laughs> I see those are passing things. But there's some eternal things that we can grasp hold of, and that is we have a Savior who came down for us. We are no longer lost. And this is a time that we get to say thank you. <laughs> we get to worship. We get to participate in worship right now as we give again. And I'm so grateful for that. Please remember, if you're giving to Lottie Moon, to mark your check or mark your envelope this morning. Would you pray with me? Father, thank you so much for loving us enough to come down for us so that we don't have to remain lost. And Father, I thank you for that. I thank you for what it means to me. Oh Lord, there's no one like you. I want to worship you. I adore you, Father, for what you've done for me. You love me so that I can love you. I thank you for this opportunity, Father, that we have to give. It's just a reminder, Lord, that every good and perfect gift comes from you. We're grateful for that. You give us, you give us the ability to, to earn money, and we're grateful for that. Father, every good and perfect gift comes from you. Just to think on that over and over and over reminds me that you love me, and I'm grateful for that. I pray today, Lord that you would give us listening ears, that our hearts would be ready to receive your word when Brother Jeremy comes. I pray, Father, that we would be transformed today by the proclamation of your word, that we would take it in and we would live it out today. I pray all of this, Father, because we love you, because you first loved us. And it's in your name that we pray. Amen.
Morning, church. It's good to be with you this morning. Merry Christmas. It's that time of year. My name is Jeremy Johnson. I'm one of the associate pastors here at St. Andrew Baptist Church, and this morning is my great privilege to lead you in this aspect of our worship. So over the month of December, we have been 
uh, navigating through the Gospel of John. How many of you guys are reading with us? Raise your hand. All right, that's good. We've had a few interruptions in our lives lately. Understand that, but it is good to be in the Word of God. So our text this morning is going to come from John chapter 13. Before we jump in, uh, allow me to set just a little bit of context because I think it's going to help us uh, get a better grasp of what God is teaching us here. So John 13 marks a, a turning point in the Gospel of John and in the ministry of Jesus Christ. At the end of John chapter 12, we see that, that Jesus is concluding his ministry uh, among men, among the public. And now, as he is turning from his ministry to men, he is now turning towards this very intimate and very personal time that he'll have with his disciples. So through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, John writes to us in chapters 13 through 18, and, and what he writes covers really just the span of just a few hours on the Thursday night before the death of Jesus Christ into the, the early mornings of, of Friday even. So we today are going to be on this Thursday night of Jesus' last week. And Jesus is actually meeting with his disciples for the Passover, which is the memorial dinner that commemorates God's deliverance of the children of Israel from Egypt. And after this, Jesus and the disciples, minus Judas, he'll be dismissed, but they will then go to the Garden of Gethsemane, where Jesus will pray in agony Thursday night into Friday morning. And then he will be arrested, and he will be tried through these mock trials. You know the story, right? And then he dies for us. So I want you to know how important our setting is, okay? So this is the Thursday night before Jesus is going to the cross, and he knows this. Like, Jesus knows what is about to happen. But instead of being all concerned and tied up and preoccupied with what is going to happen to him and his impending death and his taking on of our sin and his ultimate glorification, Jesus is turning his focus, his attention, and his love towards these 12 men. And this is such proof, such proof that our God doesn't love the world with this impersonal love that he just cast in the direction of men. But rather, he loves each of us intimately and personally and deeply. And he shows this through his character as he cares for these 12 men just moments before he is going to face this extreme agony and extreme pain. And my hope for us today as we look through John chapter 13 is that we will get just a glimpse, just a glimpse of the love that our God has for us. So if you have your Bibles, go ahead and, and grab those and turn with me to John chapter 13. The text is also going to be up on the screen if you'd rather uh, follow along there. But listen up, church. Guys, pay, pay attention at this moment because this is the most important thing that I will say all morning. John chapter 13, starting in verse 1. It says, before the Passover festival, Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart from this world to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. Now when it was time for supper, the devil had already put it into the heart of Judas, Simon Iscariot's son, to betray him. And Jesus knew that the Father had given him everything into his hands, and that he would come from God, and that he was going to God. So he got up from supper. He laid aside his outer clothing. He took a towel and he tied it around himself. Next, he poured water into a basin and he began to wash the disciples' feet and to dry them with a towel tied around him. And he came to Simon Peter who asked him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? And Jesus answered him, what I'm doing, you don't realize now, but afterward you will understand. You will never wash my feet, Peter says. And Jesus replied, if I don't wash you, you have no part with me. So Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not only my feet, but also my hands and my head. One who is bathed, Jesus told him, doesn't need to wash anything except his feet, but he is completely clean. You are clean, but not all of you. For he knew who would betray him. This is why he said, not all of you are clean. And when Jesus had washed their feet, and put on his outer clothing, he reclined again and said to them, Do you know what I have done for you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are speaking rightly, 
since that is what I am. So if I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you also should do just as I have done for you. Truly I tell you, a servant is not greater than his master, and a messenger is not greater than the one who sent him. If you know these things, you are blessed if you do them. So the first thing that I want us to look at together this morning is the vastness of God's love. Like I want us to look at just how vast the love of Jesus is for us. And we see that right at the beginning of verse 1. So before the Passover festival, Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart from this world to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. Like Having loved his own... He loved them to the end. This is the love of Christ. Having loved them through his life, now Jesus was going to love them through his death. Having loved them when when things were, were good, when people were wanting to crown him as king, now Jesus is going to love them when things are difficult and people are going to scream, crucify him. This is the love of our God. And from a worldly standpoint, we are typically moved to believe That someone loves us when two things appear. When they will stick with us through time. And when they will stick with us when it is costly. And this is exactly what we see from Jesus. Having loved his own extensively throughout the years. Being patient with their sin and with their misunderstanding. He also loves them intensively as, as he knows that he is about to suffer the uttermost depths of pain on the cross. Like he stuck with them over time. He stuck with them when it was costly. So the love of Christ is extensive. And Webster defines extensive as covering a large area. And I submit to you today that eternity past to eternity future is a large area. That is the love of Christ. And the love of Christ is also intensive. As eternal deity, as as God, he chose to leave glory to come to earth as a child. I mean, that is love. That is humility. As king of kings, he came not to be served, but to serve. And then as our sinless savior, he went to the cross on our behalf and absorbed the wrath of God for our sin. The love of Christ is intensive. And this is what we long for. We long for a a love that is radical, a love that is deep and excessive, that's constant and unending. And this is what we have by faith. This is what we have by faith. This is not a romantic love. It's not sentimental. It's not based or tied up in emotion. It's not fickle. This is an eternal love that brings with it eternal salvation, eternal glory. This is a gracious love. Guys, we don't deserve this love. And this is an unconditional love. This love is not predicated on anything that we have done to earn it. In fact, this love is lavished upon us in full awareness of our wretchedness. This is an unconditional love. It's a generous love. Its depth is incomprehensible, sacrificial. Greater love is no man than this, than one would lay down his life for his friends. This is the love of Christ. It is extensive. He sticks with us over time. His love is eternal, and this love is intensive. He sticks with us when it is costly. He paid the ultimate price. In the next two verses, they actually further express the depth of Jesus' love as we dig into them. Verse 2 says, Now when it was time for supper, the devil had already put into the heart of Judas, Simon Iscariot's son, to betray him. And Jesus knew that the Father had given everything in his hands, that he had come from God, and that he was going back to God. So what do we we learn from the the mention of Judas here? And I'll tell you that that the, the contrast is so stark that I I believe it's actually instructive to some degree. Here we we see the darkest of hatred 
compared to the purest of love. The darkest of hatred in Judas and his betrayal compared to the purest of love in Christ. And look, guys, if I'm honest, Judas confuses me. Like, I, I, don't, I don't understand Judas. He spent three years with Jesus. He heard everything that Jesus had to say. He saw everything that Jesus did. He knew the perfect life that Jesus lived, yet he still gave himself to Satan. But if I continue in that same vein of honesty, I have to admit that I can relate to Judas when it comes to the betrayal of Jesus. I mean, how many times have I turned from God's grace to live, to live, act, be, and do what I want to do for my own selfish purposes? And this is humbling because of my sin, but it is encouraging because we see just how much Jesus loves us. And even though Jesus knew me, he served me at the cross. Even though he knew that I would betray him, he went to the cross willingly for me. And through repentance and faith, which is the only thing that separates me from Judas, through repentance and faith, I have been made new. I've been forgiven. So when we think about our betrayal of Judas, and we see it in the most notorious example that is Judas, it helps us put into perspective just how vast Christ's love really is. And then in verse 3, he says he knew that he had come from God and was going back to God. And guys, this is a, a huge feature of this passage. This is a statement of Jesus' absolute and eternal being and deity. Like Jesus is on his way back to the glory that he shared with the Father before creation. And it seems like in this moment that after 33 years of a perfect life that someone would understand what is happening. Like that someone would see just how majestic and glorious this man is and that they would want to wash his feet. And this is the king of kings. And this is the Lord of lords. This is the one who holds a name that every knee will bow and every tongue will confess in heaven and on earth and under the earth that no one steps up to serve him. These guys were actually fighting over their own honor. And we see this in a parallel passage from Luke that tells us that these guys were actually arguing over which one of them was going to be the greatest. At this moment, the disciples were all about their own dignity. They were all about exalting themselves. And when you're arguing like that, no one's going to stoop to the level of a servant and wash the other's feet. It's just not going to happen. Everything was there. The basin was there. The water was there. The towel was there. But no one stepped up to serve the other. And we're about to see in just a moment that Jesus, rather than being concerned with his own impending death, which was coming in just a matter of of ours, he exhibits this humble service and this perfect love for his disciples. His attitude of servanthood was in direct contrast with those of the disciples. Listen, they didn't deserve the love of Jesus, but nor do we. I mean, their actions, especially in this moment, didn't warrant for Jesus to do what he was about to do. But our actions throughout our lives haven't warranted what Jesus has done for us. I mean, this is what is so miraculous about the love of Christ. This is grace. Let's look at the demonstration of Jesus' love in verses 4 and 5. It says, he got up from supper, laid aside his outer clothing, and took a towel and tied it around himself. Next, he poured water into a basin, and he began to wash his disciples' feet and to dry them with a towel tied around him. So let's put ourselves in this context for just a moment. These guys have been walking to get to the upper room, which is in Jerusalem. They've been walking through the streets of Jerusalem, come from Bethany, about two miles. And in this day, uh, you know, the, the, the streets are dirty, potentially even muddy, and they're wearing uh, sandals, you know, so 
naturally, by the time they arrive, their feet are going to need some attention. Before most every house, there would be a, a pot of water there to accommodate the foot washing. And this is a task that would typically fall to the lowliest of servants because it was the lowliest of tasks. I mean, it would be very uneducated and unskilled men and women who would be performing this task. I mean, if I picked, right now, if I, if I were just to go through the room and pick 12, you know, teenage boys and young guys, and I gave them sandals and told them to go walk in the dirt and the mud uh, for several hours, and then I took a poll and said, which of you wants to clean their feet before we have supper? I mean, how many of you guys are volunteering for that gig? Yeah? And that's a, that's, a, that's a tough gig, right? If you've got um, a weak stomach or <laughs> bad gag reflex, you're out. You, you can't do this. And this, this is seriously a, a bad gig, and this is one that typically fell to the lowliest of servants. I want us to understand the custom that we, we're dealing with. Because these verses actually give it to us in such a simple, straightforward, matter-of-fact way. Like Jesus just did this. But guys, this is not the average peasant from the streets of Jerusalem who is washing the feet of these sinful men. This is the Lord of all creation who humbles himself. I mean, for a fisherman to wash another fisherman's feet, I mean, that, that would have been a sacrifice of dignity. I mean, that would have been bad enough. But for our creator, eternal God, savior of our souls, to stoop to this level and wash the feet of, of lowly men as they're sinful in their pride and argue about which one of them is the greatest, then this is genuine humility. And this is genuine love. With calmness and, and majesty and humility and love, Jesus rises up and begins to wash their feet. Love will humble itself. That's exactly what Jesus does here. Jesus humbly serves others. 1 Corinthians 13, 5 says that love is not self-seeking. I mean, Jesus could not have been so consumed with the passion for serving others if he had been primarily concerned with himself. Now let's apply that to ourselves. Like we cannot be consumed with passion for serving and loving others as long as we are primarily concerned with ourselves. So let's look at Jesus' conversation with Peter. Jesus makes his way to Peter, and of course, of course, Peter opens his mouth. He says, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? And I picture him actually putting the emphasis on the pronouns here. Like I picture saying, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? And then we see Jesus' response in verse 7. What I'm doing you don't realize now, but afterward you will understand. And if we can take just a quick break for a minute, isn't that an appropriate statement for where we are today? <laughs> I mean, how many of you guys realize exactly what Jesus is doing in and through our city after this storm? Like, I, 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 don't, I don't know. But so much of our Christian life is spent trusting Jesus now and understanding him later. And praise God, he is trustworthy. We can trust him. But Peter grows bolder in verse 8. He says, you will never wash my feet. Jesus' response is, if I do not wash you, you have no part with me. And then Peter returns with, Lord, wash not only my feet, but wash my hands and my head also. Isn't that just like Peter? <laughs> I mean, to go from never will you wash my feet to, Lord, not only my feet, but wash my hands in my head also. But guys, we get where Peter's coming from, don't we? Like, put yourself in that position. Can't you understand what Peter's going through? I mean, he's saying, like, Jesus is over here washing our feet. And he doesn't understand why that's happening. He can't allow that to happen. I can understand that. He's saying, Jesus is my king. I'm not going to let him wash my feet. Peter's mind there was no room for Jesus to humble himself in this way. Like Peter is still expecting something different. Thomas touched on this last week. He said that the Jews, including Peter, they were expecting a conquering king. So for this man to humble himself and to begin to wash their feet was outside their expectation. This is just 
more text proof that Jesus truly was the unexpected Messiah. And if Jesus is struggling at this point, if Peter is struggling at this point, to allow Jesus to humble himself and wash his feet, can you imagine how he's going to feel the next day? When Jesus humbles himself, allows men to, to beat him and mock him and spit on him and put him on a cross to take the sins of the world. Jesus' is, his love is amazing. So look again at what Peter says in verse 9. He says, not only my feet, but my hands and my head also. And then we see Jesus' response. One who is bathed doesn't need to wash anything except his feet, but he is completely clean. There is profound spiritual truth in Jesus' words right here. Jesus, as he is speaking with Peter, he moves uh, from this physical illustration of humbling himself into this deep spiritual truth of the washing and the cleansing of the inner man. So when a person believes in Jesus, he is completely cleansed. He's made clean before God. That is what he says in verse 10, the one who is bathed does not need to wash except for his feet, but he is completely clean. Like our need for the repeated washing of our feet represents our need to continually repent of our sin and turn to Jesus. This is exactly what John was teaching in 1 John 1, 8 and 9. So if we, have, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. The truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And by the way, if you go read 1 Peter, you will see that he eventually did completely understand this concept. And we have to understand this concept. As followers of Christ, we need to know that our standing with God is unshakable. That we have been made completely clean. We have been justified. We have been made new. We are redeemed. When we come to Christ for the washing of sins, we can be sure that it is permanent and it is complete. We can be sure of that. There is no act that can cleanse us further from our sins. Because our sin has been exchanged for the perfect righteousness of Christ. So positionally, we are clean. Just as Jesus told Peter in verse 10, if we are in Christ, positionally we are clean. But on the practical side, as we walk through this world, we need cleansing. Because we will get our feet dirty with sin. And guys, this is quite simple. You don't come to the table with dirty feet. I mean, if you invite me over for dinner and I kick my shoes off in the foyer and my feet reek, it's going to affect our fellowship that night. That's the reality of it. I mean, we're still going to be friends, we're still going to be brothers, but that night our fellowship is going to suffer. It's the same way with God. Like we have to come to God with a clean heart, one that has been forgiven through repentance so that the fellowship is sweet. And the beauty, the beauty in all of this is that the God who is offended by the stench of our sin is the same God who is willing to wash us clean. That's beautiful. I pray that we as a church, as individuals, would recognize the gravity of our sin before a holy God. And that that would drive us to repentance. And this section ends with the second part of verse 10 and verse 11. And it reads this, you are clean, but not all of you. For he knew who would betray him. And this is why he said, not all of you are clean. So once again, we see that woven into the backdrop of John 13 is this, this story of Judas. And Jesus knew. Jesus knew what Judas was going to do. But yet at this moment, the same hands that eventually would be pierced are now kneeling and washing the feet of the one who would betray him. And I'm telling you guys, the love of our God is incomprehensible. 
So Jesus, having inserted this lesson on salvation and repentance, now returns to the emphasis of his teaching to his disciples. And here's the question that I want to pose for you. Like, I want you to ask yourself this question. How do I love? How do I love? This is personal. Let's read verses 12 through 17 and see if we can draw out some application here. It says, when Jesus had washed their feet and put on his outer clothing, he reclined again and said to them, do you know what I have done for you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are speaking rightly since that is what I am. So if I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I've given you an example, that you also should do just as I have done. Truly I tell you, a servant is not greater than his master, and a messenger is not greater than the one who sent him. If you know these things, you are blessed if you do them. Notice that Jesus begins by arguing from the greater to the lesser. He says, if I, being Lord and teacher, am willing to gird myself with a towel and, and stoop to the lowest of lows to wash your feet, shouldn't you, as my disciples, also be willing to do that for one another? Guys, and he's, let's get to the, the point of this. He's not actually saying, do what I do. What Jesus is saying is, behave as I have behaved. This is not about the literal washing of feet. This is about humility, the humility of Christ. We must humbly serve one another. And why is it so important that we understand humility? Because humility is the pathway to grace. What does his word say? It says God gives grace to who? The humble. It says God exalts who? The humble. First Peter 5, 5, and 6. It says, in the same way, you who are younger, be subject to the elders. All of you clothe yourselves with humility toward one another, because God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that he may exalt you at the proper time. Did you pick up on who wrote this? Under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, Peter wrote these words I think he got it I pray that we'll get it I pray that we'll get it and look guys this is practical humility I mean for Jesus to stop in the middle of his journey remember when we set the context where we said we were we're just a a day at best away from the crucifixion of Christ and he stops in the middle of this journey to to perform the lowliest of tasks for his disciples. And we got to see what he's done here. Because we are called to serve others even when it's inconvenient. And there are a lot of people in this room, myself included, who are willing to be inconvenienced as long as it is convenient. And you think I just misspoke, spoke, didn't you? I said what I meant to say. Like, we are willing to be inconvenienced as long as it is convenient. Let me explain. When I go on a mission trip, when I sign up for a mission trip, when I I serve my, um, not serve my time, that sounds like a prison sentence, but when I serve at the center of hope, when I'm scheduled to serve, there we go, when I'm scheduled to serve at the center of hope, when I have planned and prepared to do ministry, I will go all out to serve those around me. And I will share the love of Christ with them. And this is a good thing. Like, don't hear me say this is a bad thing. This is a good thing. This should be part of what you do. But notice that I said it is in these moments. Like, it's in these moments that I am ready and willing to be inconvenienced. Did you let a brother call me on Saturday during an Alabama football game? You let somebody need me on Saturday when I've finished my to-do list and I've come inside to play with my kids or rest or, or hang out with my wife. When the doorbell rings at that moment, you know what happens? Man, I am so tempted to duck and hide. Like, don't answer the door. Like, everybody quiet. 
because I want to rest. Like, I don't want to be inconvenienced at that moment. I want to choose when I want to be inconvenienced. So, are we really willing to be inconvenienced? I have to ask myself that question. (laughs) Friday, two days ago, I'm right in the middle of working on this sermon. And I go home at like 2.30. And my wife and kids are there because school had gotten out early. I had a little bite to eat, and I sat on the couch, and I told my wife, I said, I'm going to rest for 15 minutes before I head back into the office. I mean, and it's relative, okay? There's five kids running around. I'm really not going to get a whole lot of rest. But I wanted to sit down for 15 minutes and just kind of relax. A minute into sitting down, guess what happened? Ding dong. <laughs> and my kids run by the door, and they're like, Dad, it's Mr. Ron, the neighbor. I'm like, great. Because if it's Mr. Ron, the neighbor, I know what he's going to say. He needs me to help him move something again. And I want to rest. Like, I'm not willing to be inconvenienced at this moment. And I have to remind myself of of the servanthood of Jesus, his attitude in this. And I'm I'm trying to share Christ with my neighbor. I I believe that he is a born-again believer, but I don't know that for sure yet. I mean, we're working on that. So my temptation is that I'm fixing to roll off the couch and slither back to my room, hide under the covers and tell my wife, tell him I'm not here. That's what I want to do. That's what runs through my mind. But what I needed to do was get up and to serve my brother and use that five minutes to tell him about the love of Christ as we were moving furniture. So we have to ask ourselves, are we really willing to be inconvenienced? And we've talked a lot about love and humility. All right, so men, look at me for a minute. I have to make something clear. This is not I'm not asking you to be weak and emotional. Those are not synonyms for being humble and loving. When you think of this, what I want you to think of is what Christ did as he served others. You can do this without being weak and without being emotional. You can be humble and love others. Don't be confused or scared by these words. Recall the attitude of Jesus because we cannot do these things without heeding God's word. We cannot do these things without being intentional to love others in action and in truth. And if our master will humbly serve others in this way, friends, we are not exempt. We are not exempt. And we have to beware of the excuses that we make for not serving others. And we need to trace these right back to the source. If my excuses for not serving others, if they're not legitimate, 99.9% of the time, typically what they are is a conscience soothing way of saying that I am too good to serve you. Or a conscience soothing way of saying I am too busy to serve you, which I will tell you a lot of the times translates into I am too important to serve you. That's not what our king did. It's not what we should do. We need to serve others even when it's truly inconvenient. So finally, take a look at what John writes in verse 17. He says, if you know these things, you are blessed if you do them. If we do them, we are blessed. So as we follow Christ in this way, blessing will find us. And this is not likely that blessing is going to find us as we are on the throne being given tribute. But it's more likely that blessing is going to find us when we're kneeling on the floor with a towel in our hands, ready, ready to serve our brothers. And the other blessing is that the world will know that you are saved. The gospel will be lifted up and Christ will be exalted. So if we look quickly, just a few verses outside of our text, in John 13, 35, it says, By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Guys, if there is contention and strife within the church, if this is what the world sees, what is their conclusion going to be? 
It's not going to be that we have been transformed by this love of Christ that is unlike anything that they know. And sadly, there are a lot of churches that are filled with men who are standing on their own dignity when they should be kneeling at the feet of their brother. When we're tempted, St. Andrew Baptist Church, when we are tempted to think of our dignity and our prominence, I pray that we will open our Bibles and go to John 13 and see a picture of Jesus clothed as a slave, humbling himself and kneeling and washing the feet of sinners. Think about this. The majestic and glorious God of the universe came to earth as a child. That's humility. That is love. And then while he was here, he knelt at the feet of sinners and washed their feet and served them. And this is perfect humility expressed through love and action. Church, let us be humble. Let us humble ourselves and serve one another so that the gospel may be known and our God may be exalted. You know that right after Jesus washed the feet of his disciples that very night, he instituted the Lord's Supper. Today we're going to share in the Lord's Supper. So as our praise team comes up and our deacons prepare to serve you, let me remind you of the meaning of this supper. This is an ordinance of our Lord in which believers, those who have been saved, those who have trusted in Christ, we eat bread that signifies Christ's body that was given for us. And then we drink the cup of the Lord, which signifies the new covenant that's given to us through the blood of Christ. And we do this in remembrance of Jesus proclaiming his death and resurrection and longing and looking to the day of his return. So let me encourage you, as these guys sing about the depth of God's love for us, will you take this time seriously? Use this time to repent. Hey, don't, don't come to this table with dirty feet. Don't come to this fellowship with our Lord with sin in your life. Repent. And then use this time to reflect and to think on the magnitude and the vastness of God's love and what he has done for us. The humility expressed by his act with towel and basin as he washed the feet of his disciples foreshadows his ultimate act of humility and love on the cross. Matthew 20, 28 says this, He came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many.
and on this night that Brother Jeremy has so well described for us, Jesus took the bread and gave thanks. And our Father, we give thanks for this simple bread that pictures for us he who is the bread of life. He, though tempted in all ways, just as we, was without sin. It took our sin upon his own body to pay the penalty for ours. I pray, Father, as we partake of this bread, that we will remember the Lord Jesus until he comes. In his name we pray. Jesus took the bread and broke it. He said, this is my body which is broken for you. Eat this in remembrance of me. In like manner, he took the cup. And our Father, we give thanks for the cup. The fruit of the vine that pictures the blood that flowed in our Savior's veins. He taught without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. And so when he went to the cross, he allowed his own blood to be shed. To pay the price for our sin once and for all on Calvary's cross. May we never forget. May we forever remember our Savior Jesus who purchased our salvation on Calvary. In Jesus' name, amen. Jesus said, this is the new covenant in my blood. As often as you drink it, do it in remembrance of me. So as many of you know, our custom is to receive an additional offering each time we take the Lord's Supper together. This offering goes to our Helping Hands ministry and our theme verse for this ministry is Galatians 6.10. It says, therefore, as we have opportunity, let us work for the good of all, especially for those who belong to the household of faith. So the money that is given today to this ministry will be given uh, and used to serve those in our church and also their, those in our community. And there are many in our city that are hurting. And there are many of you uh, in our congregation that are hurting right now. And listen, if, if you find yourself in that place, you're hurting you need assistance. You need help. I'm not asking you to give to this additional offering at this point. As a matter of fact, what we would ask that you would do is that you would communicate your needs to us so that through this ministry, we might serve you. Would you, would you allow us the blessing of serving you in that way? But there are others of you that are, that God has, God has blessed you, and you're able at this point to give to this ministry. You're able to serve your brother or your sister in this capacity. So I want to tell you, as you leave today at the exits, there will be offering baskets, offering plates there. If you want, as you leave, if you would give uh, to that. If you have need, would you communicate that to us? And guys, we have talked about this love, but let me, let me tell you, this kind of love that we've talked about today has to be rooted in the gospel of Jesus Christ. To follow Jesus by humbly serving and loving others requires a fundamental change of our nature. He has to change who we are. If I'm not changed, I can't live a life of humble service. Thankfully, when Jesus sacrificed his life on the cross in my place and absorbed the wrath of God for my sin, giving me the gift of faith so that I could turn in repentance and faith and obedience to him, he also changed my nature. He changed my heart. 
made me a new man. So that what at one point was impossible for me, a life of humble service, is now not only possible, but it is a blessing. But look, I, I don't want to I don't want to act like this is easy. The cost, the cost of discipleship is high. But if you ask any follower of Christ in this building right now, they will tell you that it is worth it. So if it is something that you are considering today, giving your life to Christ and following him, I tell you the cost is high, but it is so worth it. If you want to talk about that a little bit more, some of our pastoral staff is going to be down at the front at the end of the service. We would love to talk to you about what it looks like to give your life to Christ. I mean, what better gift to receive at Christmas than the love of Christ? If you need membership in a, a local church, we'd love to talk to you about what it looks like to be a covenant member at St. Andrew Baptist. Man, if you just have struggles in your life right now, you want somebody to pray with, we would love to pray with you. Maybe things in your life are going great. Maybe this week something turned and you got a, a, a big blessing in your life and you want to share that. Come give us a brief report and let us praise God with you. We're going to be down front. Mark's going to come. He's going to lead our benediction. We'll be down front. We love you guys. Merry Christmas. Amen. Thank you, Jeremy. It's been a great morning, church. Just a few announcements before you guys are dismissed. Uh, as Jeremy has said, we would love as pastors uh, to come and pray with you this morning uh, to talk about any decision that you've made for Christ. Also, with your communion cups uh, this morning, if you don't mind, take those with you as you head on out. There'll be garbage cans in the back to kind of put those in, uh, kind of help us out with that. And as well, there will be uh, ushers in the back to collect the helping hands offering as you prepare to give that on your way out. Uh, one, uh, one really big announcement. We really, really hope that you will be at one of our Christmas Eve services tomorrow night, uh, 4.30 and 6 o'clock. Uh, we do this uh, because we don't have the room and the capacity just to do one service, and this service is for the whole family. And so we hope that you will be here and your family will be here. You invite neighbors and friends, uh, co-workers to be a part of this. Uh, it, it's a short service, 40 minutes long, uh, but we are able, able to come and, and time a prayer, uh, singing Christmas carols together. Uh, there will be a monologue by Brother Mike, and then also we will close with a special candlelight service. So we hope that you will be a part of that uh, Christmas Eve service, 4.30 and 6 tomorrow night. Let me close with this benediction. As Jeremy has preached this morning for us to love one another, not as we love each other, but as Christ loves us. Colossians chapter 3, verses 16 and 17 says this, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thanksgiving in your hearts to God. And whatever you do, within word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. And all God's people said, amen. amen. Merry Christmas.